If you can tell a lot about a filmmaker from their choice of material, then what do we know about Mary Heron? Uh, her debut feature, I Shot Andy Warhol, was daring. Take this. The police are looking for me and want me. I shot Andy Warhol. Told the true story of an unhinged feminist who pumped three bullets into Warhol and nearly killed him. Then came this, American Psycho starring Christian Bale before he was Batman. And of course he was a Wall Street killer in American Psycho. And the film, by the way, ignited a fury of anti-violence, outrage, and feminist protest. But to Mary, it was always meant to be social satire, a comment on the image-obsessed consumer culture. In the morning, if my face is a little puffy, I'll put on an ice pack while doing my stomach crunches. I can do a thousand now. She then told the story of the 50s pinup queen Betty Page, you know, the image that sparked a million tattoos. I pose naked for photographs. Set against, of course, a larger backdrop of censorship and artistic freedom. These films include bondage, spanking, and flagellation, all illegal to send through the U.S. mails. If Mary's a bit of a provocateur, then it's not surprising. See, her father is the Canadian comedian, satirist, and legend Don Heron, a.k.a. Charlie Farkasen. Mary herself studied at Oxford, where she uh, dated a young man named Tony Blair. Then in the 70s, she worked as a music journalist and landed the first ever American interview with the Sex Pistols before taking hold as a filmmaker. Her latest is a modern gothic thriller called The Moth Diaries, and despite its blood and gore, Mary calls it a portrait of adolescence, you know, with vampires. Do you believe in the supernatural? <laughs> hey, everybody, please welcome Mary Harris. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. How are you? Good. This is a... Um, so I watched this movie and I thought, oh, to, to have to throw yourself into the mind of a teenager, the brain of a teenager, oh, yes. for as long as you did. <laughs> now, look, I, I have had a teenager's brain. I am often still accused of having <laughs> versions of that. But just the, sort of the madness that goes on and the development of it. Did you appro approach it that way when you made the picture? Yes, I mean, when I started writing the script, my I have two daughters, my older daughter was 10, and I thought, by the time this film gets made, she'll be an adolescent, and she's now 14. And I lived through uh, the crazy transformation, and I've always felt like every teenager's uh, life is their own horror movie because of what happens to their bodies, you know. In a year, you transform, you know, body horror, one thing to another, you know, and the crazed hormones. And in the case of girls, these, what the film is really about is about these intense, crazy friendships that girls form. Did you Excellent. have these relationships when you were a kid? Um, actually, uh, when, I, when I was in Toronto, you know, until I was 12, I, I was at, uh, you know, Deer Park School in Jarvis. Nice. <laughs> uh, and I had very intense uh, friendships, which did not end to death and disaster. And I actually, I did not, you know... <laughs> none, of you, none of you, in fact, were past lives vampires. Strangely enough, we weren't. See, I wasn't sure if this came from a true story or Strangely not. Strangely enough, not. Um, uh, nor did I do some of the wild things that the heroine does in this, in this film. But I remember these wonderful and actually very beautiful and incredibly, where, where your friendships mean more than your family, more than anything. And almost until you, really until I got married and had children, no, no relationship was as, as intense as the ones I felt with my friends. Was the, was the fact that Twilight was so big uh, a, a hindrance to your project or was it actually a, a benefit? It's been horrible because, and I, 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 I love Twilight, you know, I've been just, I have, I have daughters, I, have, yeah. I, I go to all of them, you know, I sit with all the girls. You don't and, love all the movies because they're not know, all good movies. I, <laughs> I love the fact that my daughters love them, you know. When my daughter went to see the first one, she came home and I said, how was it? I didn't actually see the first one. She said, it's the greatest film ever made. Okay. <laughs> so we're not allowed to let your daughter into filmmaking then. Yes. <laughs> I'm but, kidding. But, I'm kidding. You know, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that um, I think now Twilight completely uh, changed everybody's definition. And now they, everybody thinks, oh, well, if you have, you know, a character who, who is thought of or suspected of being a vampire, as in, as in my uh, film, then it must be Twilight. Right. So in that sense, it's been it's been uh, something. Uh, and if you if you go to see my film and you think it's going to be like Twilight, you will be painfully disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> in the post-American Psycho world, when you were dealing with all the noise around it and the, and the criticisms and all that stuff, how did you handle that? You know the way the, you know the way you handle any crisis in your life. You just <laughs> like wow, well, that's on. different for lots of people. <laughs> I, I think it's just you have to have faith. Um, the initial reaction to American Psycho, you know, a lot of it was very hostile, and, um, and indeed it was was I don't think considered a success when it first came out. And now it's you know I'm always amazed at how how it's been reclassified as you know 
this film that, that everybody seems to love. It's like, well, didn't everybody hate it, you know, 10 years ago? Well, the, the, I wondered how you felt about the range of emotions. So I shot Andy Warhol, you, get this, you become this feminist icon, and mm -hmm. then with American Psycho, Everybody hates me. Yeah, because they, all the, the, what they perceive as misogyny in it. Yeah. And I thought, I wondered, well, you made it. How, what, how did you feel about the, the switch? Well, it's funny because when we were writing it, um, I was writing it, my, the script was written with Guinevere Turner, who had written uh, this pioneering lesbian uh, rom romantic comedy, Go Fish, and I'd, writ and I'd made Aisha Andy Warhol. And we thought, well, you know, we have the right to do this, and, and we dare anybody to come and, and tell us that we're misogynist. Yeah. You know, so we actually probably were the only people who would be able to approach that with confidence, because I think that we saw that what Brett had done was a satire. Of, of misogyny and, a, and a, criti a critique and a crazy, dark, dark black comedy. Oh, the, nothing is funnier than the Huey Lewis scene. Oh. It's like in the worst moment, it's the funniest moment. Yeah, and I think that we, we, we felt that, that I, I felt that from the beginning I read the book. Yes, it's extraordinarily violent, more violent than the film, but I, I, never, I never had any doubts about what, and I think Brett would say that himself, that it was a critique. What's your relationship with feminism now? Well, I feel like um, if there was no feminism, I would not be making films, you know. If, How so? Because when I was growing up, I knew of one film director. One, I, I had heard of one female film director, Lenny Riefenstahl. Yeah. Not a good role model. <laughs> Though a woman who spent some time with the New York uh, punk scene in the 70s, right? You know, yeah. uh, Penelope Spheris has turned out to be well, an yes, important and, filmmaker. And, and, now, and now, you know, now as I got older, you know, that was when I was like 10, you yeah. know, whatever. And, and then there was Penelope Spheris. There Mom, were, there I want to grow up to be many, just many, like Hitler's director. Yes, yeah. But then, you know, there were so many film directors, and, it, and I'm always asked, like, why aren't there more? It's like, well, when I was growing up, there was nobody, practically. And, and look at, you know, Catherine Bigelow, this brilliant film. You know, Andrew Arnold, there's, there's, um, in, in, Lynn Ramsey, there's incredible, oh, Sarah Pauly. Right, there's also an incredible amount, and I hear a lot about how there aren't enough women in, in film. There's tons of women who are producers and yes. who are, and who are writers, and there's lots of women on film sets. So there's, it's not like this industry doesn't have women participating. I, I have to say, it's, it's, you know, not an easy job to take. I think um, probably one, at least one of my daughters will want to make films. I can't say you'll have an easy road. Yeah. You know, but, uh, but do you think it would be an easier road? Is that a gender issue, or is it just that it's the nature of the job? Is that it's difficult? My husband's a film director too. It's it's never easy, and I think um, to me actually, it's not so much having been uh, a woman director, but of, on my last two films, Notorious Betty Page and this one, I wanted to tell to tell specifically female stories with women in the lead, and that will still be harder. In film, if you really want to do that, go to television, because that's where all those stories are living right now. Yes, yes, and and I actually I do direct quite a bit of television. Yeah. And so, do you find that you can you can tell those stories differently there? Yes, I mean, you know, I, I worked on Big Love, and I worked on you know Six Feet Under, and other other you know wonderful wonderful uh, television series. But sometimes you just you know you want to make a movie. Sure. And and I feel like you know, it's an extremely hard uh, profession. But when you get your movie made, and I, I found this with all my films actually, you just get it out there, it's something you believe in, it's a story that, that's, that's, if it speaks to you and it's your heart and you carry it through as, as well as you can, then it will live in some way and people will keep watching it years later, I hope. Yeah, there's lots of ways for your, for your work to reach people. I know everybody talks a lot, and quite rightly, about the impact of Catherine Bigelow's Oscar win. Yes. But, uh, you know, really it's the success of Bridesmaids. I think that's gonna have a really huge impact on participation in film in the next 10 years. Yes, yes. No, I, I, see, I, see, I, see a, I see a golden future. <laughs> <laughs> Take me back to the past, uh, New York, 70s. Yes. You were there when things started to really go off culturally and musically. Yes. And actually, that was an enormous help to me in my future life because I sort of stumbled in on, on the punk scene. There's a book called Please Kill Me by this guy, Legs McNeil. It's such a, it's, it's his oral history. It's just little sample stories from all these people who are there. And actually, I went with Legs the first night he went to CBGB's, and we saw the Ramones together for the first time. And I did what I think is the first interview with the Ramones, and the first interview with Talking Heads. Where's that interview? Oh, it's in Punk Magazine, issue number yeah, one. Yeah, you think that's the first one? I th you know what they said to me? Oh, you know, this. Th we did another interview for some local paper, which I think never came out. But it said, oh, yeah, we've done that. So I think it was the second, but I think it was the first published one. And Talking Heads, it was the first interview. They said, oh, we haven't been interviewed before. 
So we were all really wow. young, and I'm still in friends. I'm Facebook friends with them. So <laughs> we're still in touch. <laughs> well, that, I mean, think of it. Did you know at the time that this thing, little thing that was happening with Bowery was going to turn into mm -hmm. something much bigger? No, what was funny is um, we knew at the time that it that it was something special and every day you would say this is magical and you knew that like every day was I mean I, I suppose apart from having my intense young female friendships that was the most intense time of my life and every day and my heart would race as I was walking towards the club it was so exciting every night you know through the broken glass of the Bowery and you know people <laughs> bums you know you know, throwing up in garbage cans. To me, it was just magical and beautiful. <laughs> yeah, New York in the 70s before Giuliani ruined it. Right? Before he ruined it, and it was just this wild, wild nighttime place. And, and, and we knew it was important, but, but if somebody had said to me, what, you're, what you and like, you know, a hundred other people are, are witnessing in this, in this little back room uh, will go all over the world, I, I would have thought you were crazy. Oh, well, it was interesting, it was all art school. Like a lot of those kids that rolled into those New York clubs to yeah. make the bands, they were art school kids, so it was essentially extracurricular activity. Whereas yeah. in London, it wasn't so much art school. It was the, I mean, there was that UK tour for the Ramones, and ultimately, that's where the, the grittiness of punk came out, that anger of punk came out. Mm -hmm. When you were there, what did it, did it feel like it was rebelling against something at the time? No, I mean, I don't think, no, I mean, well, yes, it was, it was an art rebellion. It, to me, it felt like, oh, we're, it's like poetry in the 19th century in France. You know, it was bohemia. Mm -hmm. To me, it felt very close to the 1950s Kerouac, you know, Ginsburg, the poetry underground, and those people would sort of turn, William Burroughs, you'd, you'd be there, and William Burroughs would turn up. Mm -hmm. And it was, the first night I was there, I actually went to CBGB's Warhol was there. So it was like a classic... New York underground, straight from 50s poets through the Warhol fa underground uh, to CBGBs. Then when I went to London in the summer of 76, because I had grown up, my teenagers in London, I thought, oh, Christ. Boy, they take this really seriously. And I realized that it had a social anger and a violence and, in a way, sort of a, 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 an intensity, brilliance, uh, that the New York scene didn't have. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's what happens when you add a country that's that much older with that much more class system and, and that oppression. much angrier. Absolutely, yeah. me included. And Canadians of a certain age grew up watching your father, yes, on, yes. Don Heron on television, yes. Charlie Farquharson. <laughs> um, did he give you any career advice? I mean, he gave me career advice about you know how to how to how to go through the the rough times and the smooth. Um, and I think and I think that he it was an enormous help having grown up with a father who was in the entertainment industry. So it wasn't like it was an, an utterly unknown world. You know, I, I'd been on a film set, I'd been on a TV set, so I think that was a big help. But in terms of directing, really, the actual mechanics of directing, no, you know, you're kind of out there on your own. It's good to see you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you so I much. I really appreciate it, everybody. Mary Heron got a film called The Moth Diaries. We'll be right back.